thing. So Luke chapter 13, this new series that they are, we are beginning or have begun about Jesus speaking about kingdom life. And today we're talking about narrow door entry. We've already been telling you about how we were joking about it last night. And um, yes, that was fun. <laughs> and now we read some scripture and see whether our interpretation around the dinner table was right last night. I suspect it wasn't. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside, knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there, a gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are least who will be first, who are last, I beg your pardon, who will be first, and first who will be last. I call it narrow door entry as our title. The kingdom of God, and by implications, kingdom life, was central to Jesus' teaching. Absolutely bang central to Jesus' teaching. He began his public ministry by declaring that the kingdom of God has come. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, we read these words, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 15, we read these words, The time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and re believe the good news. Again, later on in Luke's Gospel, he says the kingdom is, a, is, is a, in the midst of you. Kingdom of God, central to Jesus' teaching. I think it's important that we get that message. So we need to ask ourselves, what is this kingdom of God that is among us, that has come? The kingdom comes, and it comes with Jesus. And the two cannot be separated. It comes with Jesus. He's come to uh, inaugurate a new society, a new people. And this is going to be very different. Of course, it's not what was expected at the time. And I know we all know this. And over the next few weeks, because we're looking at this for a few weeks, um, you'll hear different interpretations of this. I won't go too big on it for now. But just to say, you would know that at the time, uh, the Jews were looking for something different. They were looking for their understanding was something far more tangible, something far more practical. They were looking for an eradication of oppression. And they wanted to see the Romans outed and got rid of. And that kind of stuff is what they were thinking of as kingdom. They wanted a Messiah come to bring those kind of stuff. Kingdom of God is about the reign of God. And the reign of God became very eminent and very real in the presence of Jesus when he came. So it's a present aspect to the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God also has a future aspect to it because there is a fulfillment of this uh, kingdom, which is when Jesus will return. So there's a present and there's a future aspect to it too. Uh, those at Bible college like Andrew will talk about the eschatological things and all that kind of stuff. It's about Jesus coming, coming back and, and the future aspect of that kingdom, the second coming. So this is what the Bible teaches about the kingdom 
of God. And the implication of this teaching is that all people, every person, will need to make a decision about Jesus. Every person will need to make a decision about Jesus. This baby called Jesus, only a few weeks ago, I said earlier on, we were celebrating Christmas. Only a few weeks ago, we were thinking through this. He is not someone who can be ignored. That's the problem. You can't ignore Jesus. Or at least if you do, the rain's not going to cease, is it? So just, we just keep going. If you do, uh, you ignore at your peril because it will have significant implications for your life. Jesus cannot be ignored. And one of the things this passage this morning teaches us is that there is no automatic qualification to God's kingdom. You don't automatically qualify. That was devastating news uh, to the people who were listening, to the Jews, because they thought that they qualified. They thought they automatically qualified because they're Jew. That's devastating news to people within this country who think they're automatically qualified because they're born in Britain, a Christian nation. Well, some of us question whether it still is a Christian nation, but you get the point that is being made. That's devastation news, devastating news for those who come to church every Sunday and think they automatically qualify. But actually, they never embrace Jesus because coming to church does not qualify you. This is quite a troubling statement. Entry to this kingdom is only possible through knowing Jesus. And here is the thing, not just knowing Jesus, being known by Jesus. Because Jesus said, but I don't know you. Are you saying, well, I know you. We had food last night. We had great food downstairs. We were joking and laughing. You remember that, don't you? Yeah, I remember that, but I don't know you. I don't know you. We have not entered into any relationship. We were just people hanging around, have, eating good food, having a good time. But I don't know you. This kind of talk, because this is hinting on exclusivity, this talk of exclusivity of Jesus as the way to, uh, to God and being in relationship with Jesus, being important to that, that kind of stuff it's just not seen as acceptable today. It just seems to be um, in our modern 21st century, I want to say politically correct world, it just seems to be too intolerant. And it's not acceptable to speak that way. It's lacking understanding. It's too narrow-minded is what we are told. Surely, a better understanding, we would say, is that there are many ways to God. Because that's what we say. There are many ways to God. That's what people say. There are many ways to God. It doesn't really matter which route you take. You're going to the same place. And I'm going to stand here this morning and categorically tell you, Jesus says, no, it is not true. He says, I am the only way. So all these People shouting loudly that these are the ways. It doesn't really matter which way you take. You're going to end up in the same place. They are wrong. It is a problem for us. Because this sort of stuff um, in our modern world where, how can I say, people talk about their truths. There is no absolute truth. The whole part of the battle with Harry and Meghan, let's not get into it, folks. Stay calm. Everywhere you go, everybody falls out over this. Is they want to tell their truth. And that's the language of the age in which we live. You've got to tell your truth. I understand that comment, but here is the thing. The implication of that and the odd working of that is that there is no such thing as absolute truth. And I want to say to you this morning, there is such a thing called absolute truth. Jesus is absolute truth. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. There is such a thing as absolute truth. This, you can begin to understand why we have such major problems in our world, in our society, uh, with morals and ethics. 
Because if it feels good to you, do it. It's your truth. You're not harming anybody. It's about you. And that just crosses just about everything to do with Christianity and a relationship with Jesus. The narrowness of the Christian faith for many in our society is a scandal. And so many of us Christians are timid and afraid to actually engage with this because we don't want to be seen to be arrogant. We don't want to seem to be uh, narrow-minded or bigoted or whatever language that people use. So many of us Christians, we zip up. We zip up. Friends, it calls for bravery and strength given by the Holy Spirit to call yourself a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. And to be open about it. I'm not talking about any camouflage kind of thing, you know, where you, you kind of like fade into the background and you're just like everybody else. I'm talking about standing up for your values and what you believe to be right and you believe to be true and what you believe you were called to as a follower of Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. That takes courage and bravery. And the Holy Spirit is the one who will give us that because we need that. With the choice of so many shouting that this is the way, Jesus declares that, John 14, 6, he is the way. And the only way, there's no other way to the Father. No other way to the Father. Now, friends, you can't cherry pick scripture. I know as Christians, we love doing that. We love the bits that we love and the bits that we don't like. We want to kind of like pretend we don't know it's there. Jesus says, there is no other way to the Father but by me. So I really don't care how sympathetic you are to your uh, Jewish friends or your Muslim friends or your Sikh friends or whatever. Of course, love them. They're your friends. But the only way to God, Jesus says, is through Jesus. I'm not causing enmity between you and your friends or your work colleagues or anybody. But I am going to stand up for what the scripture says to be truth. And I'm going to do it with grace and with humility. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit for strength to do it. There's only the one way. Paul writes into the uh, uh, young Timothy in 1 Timothy. I think I've got it up on the screen. Oh, goodness. These are coming up smaller and smaller. I've, I still, I've, I've lost something. I used to get this very nice and big on the screen. And I know I haven't changed what I do. But somehow they're getting smaller and smaller. So I've got to work on that for future. Um, but uh, there he says, there is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all humanity, for all humankind. Or then again, there was this great sermon preached by Peter. I'm sure you remember in Acts uh, chapter 4, when the Holy Spirit comes and Peter preaches this great sermon. I'm sure you all remember after that, all these thousands of people uh, came to Christ. And in, in this sermon, one of the things he said is, speaking of the crucified Christ, he said, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus. So this morning we are talking about salvation. And this matter requires our urgent attention. Knowing Jesus and being known by Jesus personally, that is the narrow door entry to God's kingdom. It's the narrow door entry. Matthew will talk about there's a wide way and all this kind of stuff, but we're not in Matthew this morning, we're in Luke, so we'll stick with Luke. It's narrow because it's the only way. Here is the rub. This door will one day be closed. It's, it's at present open. And Jesus is making the point when he speaks of kingdom life, he says, it's open. But here's the thing. He is saying, there is a limit. There is a time limit. It will close. Now, I know we don't like thinking in terms of uh, our Lord in that way at all. We think with him, there's always time. He's saying, no, there is going to come a time when you're going to come knocking at the door. And I'm going to say, but I don't know who you are. You're too late. 
I don't know who you are. And you're going to stand outside and you're going to see Abraham and you're going to see all the others and you think, whoa, I want to go over there. And you're not going to get in. Because you haven't paid attention to the time. There was a time. And that time, of course, is now. There is a time limit. And what is even more shaping for us is the fact that we don't know when that day will be. We don't know when that time is. If you've got a, a, a like a salt shaker or whatever, um, one of those egg timer things, um, you just don't know when it's going to when it's going to finish. It's, it's, it just goes and you can't see it. It just goes and you don't know when it's going to. You don't know when Jesus is going to return. And I find it disturbing. Jesus talks about this because. Friends, it, it tells me something about the urgency for our individual lives. But it tells me something about the urgency of making the gospel known to others. Evangelism, that dirty word in churches. I find it fascinating that this person goes to Jesus, obviously a Jew, goes to Jesus to ask this question. And Jesus doesn't enter into what he's asking. It's typical Jesus, isn't it? He doesn't quite answer the question you ask him. I, I, I wonder if I could master that. I don't know how to master that. I don't know how to master that. He doesn't quite answer, but he gives, he gives an answer. I find it fascinating, and typically Jesus, that he was asked about a time limit to the number being saved. So the person asks, is there, is there a limit to the number? Do you know, is there going to be X amount of people? Because there was a theological debate at the time about that, the remnant and all that kind of stuff. But Jesus says, you know something? That's really not the issue. And churches love going on to talk about numbers in that sense. He says, uh, that's not the issue. The issue is the time. Don't worry about the limitation of number. Be concerned about the limitation of time. It's interesting how Jesus switches it. Be concerned about the time and not so much the number. Forget number. Think time. Think time. Forget about others. Think about yourself. Because clearly in the implication, Jesus is saying, so where do you stand in all of this? You've come to engage me with a nice theological juicy conversation. But I really am caring for your soul right now. Where are you? Where are you in this? <laughs> Jesus ignored that theological debate that was prominent. He, allowed, he ignored talk of statistics. Churches love talking about statistics. He loved talking about, uh, he ignored all that talk about statistics. How many? And he concentrated on uh, who would be saved and the choices that are needed to be made, which will affect your today, your tomorrow, and your very future. That's what Jesus was concerned about. He says, in other words, he said to them, do everything. He said, make every effort. Make every effort. In other words, do all that is within your ability to do that you may enter the kingdom. Friends, this will take courage. This will take resolution. This will take determination. And, and the, the imagery here, when this kind of Greek word is used in other passages in, in the New Testament, is all to do with um, ath athletes preparing for games and all this kind of stuff. Take every, every effort. Last time around the table, we were talking to one of the guests about um, running, because he likes running. And so, as you know, Vicky was around the table. We were talking about uh, her and uh, having run a couple marathons and whatever. And he and I both went, ay, 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 ay. And she said, no, 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 I have to prepare for it. I have to plan for it. And it takes months of preparation uh, before I do that. There's that kind of thing going on here. Make every effort. Make every effort. Strive. Be determined to do that, that you may enter the kingdom. And remember this. Entry is not by works. It's not about self-effort. So don't think any amount of works that we do in self-effort is going to get us there. We've preached a lot about that in recent times, so I'm not going to go into that this morning. I'm just going to state that and, and move on. But it's a, accepting the grace of God 
who in his love has made possible entry possible through Jesus. That's about God's grace. It's not about our hard work or anything like that, our self-effort. No, our achievements. No, that is not going to get you entry into the kingdom. God does not save us through our activity. God does not save us through our hereditary. God does not save us by proxy. God doesn't save that way. So it won't work, as I said earlier on, to claim that you were born in a Christian family. It won't work to say, but I went to East Barnet Baptist Church for the past 40 years. I was there most Sundays. It won't work. It won't work to say that you read the Bible and you can quote the Bible better than the pastor of the church, which probably you can. It won't work. Don't care how well you know the Bible. It won't work. Good. This, those are good things, by the way. Coming to church, it's a good thing. Reading the Bible, it's a good thing. But when you're talking about salvation, it's about the acceptance, the embracing of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has come here for your sins and for my sins. He's not just a good teacher. He's a savior of the world. Jesus, born to save. We still have the Christmas signs up. I've deliberately left them up for a bit longer. I deliberately left this one up behind me. Emmanuel, God with us. Normally we take him down because Christmas is gone, but I wanted to leave it a bit longer because I know where we're going with this series. <laughs> the narrow door entry to the kingdom is only through acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior, the one who came and died for the sins of the world. The sins of the world is your sins and my sins. My debt he pays that I might live, that I might live. My death, he dies, that I might live. Amazing love, oh, what sacrifice, the Son of God, given for me, given for me. The Jews thought, as I said earlier on, that they would enter the kingdom naturally, but Jesus made it very clear that his kingdom was open to people of all nations. They thought it was exclusive to them. They thought they were the only people. But when you read this, uh, this story that we read this morning about the narrow door entry, you see that actually it was thrown wide to the east and the west and the north and the south, which is about people of nations. And that's why I love multicultural church. And I love our church. And I love celebrating our multiculturalism. And I use it in that sense in, instead of the political sense in which we use it as a nation. That we are people of nations and the people of cultures coming together to worship God. And that's a picture of heaven. Because that's what Revelation tells us. It's John again, back to John and that revelation that he has on the island of Patmos where he sees people of tribes and nations and tongues all coming together. That's the church. And then he says, uh, the Lord himself teaches us to, to pray. Um, you know, the Lord's prayer, which is uh, in it we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's heaven. His kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. The sad reality is that many who were associated with Jesus would be surprised to hear that Jesus would say, and this is in verse 26, I don't recognize you. I don't recognize you. That must be, I, that must be quite staggeringly, oh, Jesus saying, I don't recognize you. But Lord, I was there. You were in our street preaching. I came out and I listened to you. I was in the crowd. You turn all these loaves and fishes, and I yet I was there. I was in that crowd. You did all these things. I was there. What do you mean you don't know me? I was there. And Jesus says, but I don't know you. I don't know you. For such people, the sadness and the tragedy of this story this morning and this passage is that for such people, there will be disappointment and frustration at their exclusion, verse 28 tells us. Well, verse 28 says, gnashing of teeth. He uses that kind of language. 
I'm talking about disappointment and frustration at the exclusion from the kingdom. But here's the thing. Nobody needs be excluded from this kingdom because the door is open and it's open now. And all, 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 whoever you are, wherever you've come from, whatever your past, whatever your present, God waits to meet with you, to engage with you in and through Jesus because of his incredible, his most incredible love. So no one needs to panic. This is not a doom and gloom sermon preaching hell and damnation because it is talking about hell. It is talking about exclusion from God. It is talking about being with God heaven, exclusion from God hell. But it's saying the opportunity is there now. The door is open. And I wait to meet you. I like, as we come um, uh, to the end of this sermon, um, as I said, I, was began, I began thinking about the personal, uh, the corporate. Um, and when I began thinking about the corporate and our, our um, the urgency, not only for individual salvation, but of course, for us to make known this message to others. Um, I like what Spurgeon's had to say, um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I don't know if you've got to that yet, um, um, but because I was probably busy looking at my notes or something. But um, he said, it is the whole job of the whole church to preach the whole gospel to the whole world. Do you know, I like that so much. It's the whole job of the whole church. Friends, it's not our part-time job. It's a whole-time job. And it's not just the pastor's job. Yes, I know you pay my stipend and uh, I'm here to work full-time and serve in the church, serving you. But it's not my job to go and tell the whole world on your behalf. It's our job of the whole church. To preach the whole gospel. Let's not just tell them the bits that they want to hear. Let's tell them that following Jesus is hard. It's tough. But it's the best decision ever. The best decision ever. Let's not paper it over. Because that's, that doesn't fool anybody. And it does a disservice to the gospel. To the whole gospel. To the whole world, because God so loved the world that he gave his son. He loved the world. The choices we make today are very important. They affect our today's, tomorrow, our future. Jesus in this passage is saying, think about the choice you are making and be aware that the time is limited. Let me run that piece of film, two minutes of a film that I want to show you, and then we'll sing our closing song. The future is a million little choices. Practice or play video games. Two hours in the gym or two hours at the movies. A little extra work or a little extra play. Reconcile or let the sun go down on your anger. Get up or push the snooze button again. Take a potential client to the game or take a kid from a broken home. Spend that bonus on yourself or give it to a ministry that reaches out to pregnant teens. If we could get a picture of the future, if we could jump ahead 10, 15, 20 years, and see the accumulation of our decisions, the chain of events we set in motion, 
how differently would we live today? How would we choose to spend our time? What would we walk away from? How would we treat the people around us? What would we choose to pursue with passion? Where would we choose to invest our skills and our resources? Your future is a million little choices. And it starts today. Your future is a million little choices, and it starts today. And the Word of God would say, choose Jesus. As you're seated and before we sing, I'd like to lead us in a prayer for those who are listening um, here and online um, who may not be sure that you are in a relationship with Jesus. In your heart, will you please say this prayer with me? It's a short prayer. I'm taking it from a booklet which I have called Why Jesus? Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry for the things I have done. Which were wrong. Maybe you could name one or two things in your mind. Please forgive me. And I'll turn from everything I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. So that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness. Forgiveness. 